How are you doing? I'm just waiting for Joel Smith, the football coach, to join us. And then we'll do uh, coffee with the coaches. Hope you can hear me. Put my earphones in. Joel wants to be in the video. Here, we Here he is. Here he is. How, How are, are you? On? Yeah, going really well. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, I'm deep in the bunker. The deep in the That's bunker. Great, football. I'm in. Uh, I'm in the lockdown lounge. The lockdown lounge, yeah. I'm in the JS football bunker. <laughs> um, well, and then tell us about your coffee, because uh, I've got a feeling that I'm going very working class and you're going a bit um, a bit more high class, mate, this morning. Well, I woke up a bit late, so I didn't get down to my favourite local coffee shop, the Fo Foxy Coffee, so I've done my own, my own one today. Right. Have a, let's have a so, look at the vessel. Still, look at still that. a flat look at that white. Glass. Yeah, it still looks, looks flat like, white. It's, looks, uh, like it's looks like a latte. Yeah. Looks like a latte. Looks like a latte. Yeah, there's probably a little bit too much foam on top, but that's the best <laughs> I could do. It's a bit um, coffee. Mate, I'm going hardcore, working class, Manchester City Cup. It's a cup that are very rarely washed properly. Uh, you know, one of them cups that you use in coffee in or drinking tea in all the time, you just sort of rinse it and use it again because you're perpetually drinking yeah. a hot drink well i tried to wash it a little bit more this morning but i've, I've failed miserably so um well it, but, it adds to the flavor mm. so what what's the brand of instant coffee that you're drinking <laughs> how dare you um makona <laughs> but the, the, the makona indulgence but there's a certain way of doing it and only i know the secret yeah. recipe so why don't you just suck your latte and answer some questions well Mate, so i was <laughs> thinking i was thinking that you were going to be drinking was it Marcona? Marcona, as they say it. Marcona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, it's you could come up with a little um, slogan for it to get you through Corona. Drink <laughs> Marcona. And then, uh, and then, and then, coffee with the coaches will be sponsored by Marcona. Now, um, the format of this, Joel, uh, that we've discussed, and just to let everyone watching know whether you want. Well, first of all, welcome if you're watching live or or yeah, on a record on a record on a recording later um please send through any questions uh, pertaining to coaching when, whenever you're ready and we will try and answer them live um joel basically brings a topic i bring a topic and then we've already had some questions on social media that we're going to add depending on how long we waffle on for um joel i'm going to throw it open to you first um you're a soccer coach a football coach and look for, for australian audiences the term football can be used for AFL, it can be used for both rugby codes, and it can be used for soccer. So, just for clarity, I'll call it soccer, right? But That's I grew right. up with. We I, won't, I, we won't, I we won't uh, get upset at lowering yeah, us to I, ignorant people, you know. Bear in mind what country I grew up in, I do call it football, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. anywho, um, as a football coach, here's a question drills and or games. Or both? Well, I'm a big fan of uh, the saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So for me, you've got to, you've got to have a mixture of both. And, it, and it's, it's a quite a complex um, discussion, really, when you think about it, because um, where, you lo where you focus is um, it, it really varies on depending on the experience of your players that you're coaching and also the level that they're at as well. So um, for me, definitely a mixture of both. Talking about skills, um, I know people have in their head straight away that um, it's skill in isolation uh, practices, um, and it really just depends on, as I said, the level of your, of your learner, of your player. So, you know, if you bring in a bit of education theory, you've got your... You know, when you're starting out, your, your cognitive learners, the ones that have to really think about piece by piece, what, let's just use the example of controlling the ball with the inside of your foot. They've got to think about where does my foot position have to be? Where, when, where's the ball? Where is it coming to me? How fast is it coming? They're thinking about every single moment. And so, you know, you've got to break it down with no pressure, with no, um, you know, defenders. There's no decision making. It's about purely about repetition. So, um, you know, these, these, these discussions are had all around coaching, uh, coaching courses throughout the, 
throughout the country, particularly, you know, when you go to a football coaching course, the first thing they do is they put up a picture of a kid running through some markers and say, is this a drill? And then they say, no, it's not a, don't do drills. And they put up a picture of a cordless uh, uh, power drill, you know, it's, get a bit of a laugh. But, you know, I think it's important that, um, as I said, you don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. At all levels, you've got to work on your technical skills. It just depends how you pitch it. And it's got to be at um, at the level that your players need. I like to work on a... I think I developed this myself, but I'm sure it's been done before, but I'm sort of put a name to it. Um, cheers, by the way. Um, I, I go through three stages. Isolation, opposition, game. Right? So, and I like to stay in the game zone for as, as long as I can. And I, and I feel that why a lot of coaches don't like games is because there's lots of moving parts. And you see some coaches, they look at a game in training and they just look like rabbits in the headlights. They just see, they end up watching the game and they say, oh, go on, Billy, Johnny, go and score that try or whatever it may be. And uh, I feel the key to coaching games is the ability to recognise what is happening when it's happening. So, to watch it live. So, I've sat and watched soccer with you. We watched a fair bit of the European Championships. And one thing I noticed about you as a coach is that you could actually see what was going on while it was happening. You didn't have to pause the tape or rewind it or watch it three times. You could watch it live. You had a, a, a quick uh, thought process. You could, you could literally just say, oh, yeah, that's, his shape isn't right or that formation isn't right. And I suppose when I'm coaching games, I'd like to think I'm the same. If somebody's hands aren't in the right spot, if their hips aren't square, if they're not wide enough at the rook, if they don't tackle with the shoulder, all that kind of thing. Um, but I like to take it through these stages when I, when I get a group for the first time. Isolation, that's just practising a skill on its own. So let's go through, through passing the rugby league ball catch and pass you've got no defenders in front of you um you're just passing in a grid so literally that that player there can focus on catching that ball the transference and passing the ball so that would be what i'd call isolation training where the individual doesn't have any uh impact on them from anything external or limited impact external opposition is my definition of having some bodies or you might use poles in training or in football soccer you might use uh, those dummies that you get for the the free kick walls or, or whatever it may be the what do you call them the mannequins oh the mannequins oh. The ma and um you the opposition means that that skill of executing the catch and pass and in soccer it may be your ball at the feet right you then have to look up and be aware that there is something against you that can disrupt that. So if I use the rugby league analogy again, a pass now becomes a 3v2 because there's two defenders and you have to concentrate on that catch and pass with that defensive pressure in front of you, right? Now, one thing I notice when I go from coaching passing and then move it into a 3v2 scenario is the amount of times the player will get his grip pass catch carry perfect in the pa in the passing drill but then go to the 3v2 and just throw that all out of the window and concentrate on the decision making and then again i think the coaching skill is being able to go bang stop what did we just do in that passing grid oh yeah we did grip pass catch. you're right now you need to apply it even though there's defenders in front of you and i think it's that disconnect that quite often happens in coaching environments. And then a game, a game is about when and where to use it. So you're not going to pass the rugby league ball all the time. In theory, you should only pass the rugby league ball when somebody is in a better position than you, right? And I would, get, I would guess in soccer you'd have similar principles because, um, and, and a game, when you do it in a game practice, it teaches you the when and where of a skill. So if we've gone from passing to 3v2 to a game, all of a sudden, 
you're looking for decision making scenarios where you can apply those principles of 3v2 does that make sense mr joel smith well it makes sense um and yeah you've summarized you know obviously the different stages i suppose of skill application as well so you've gone from you know your skill in isolation without opposition without decision making high repetition as soon as you move it into um uh, the context of the game so you, you you've described the 3v2 um then uh then obviously there's more decision making uh less practice less repetition um because there's opponents um and then you've gone into a game where um you start to talk look at uh your game game principles so where where and when so we call it cues and triggers uh that influence decision making of the skill when to apply the skill but um so very similar in football but i suppose the the thing that um you know the debate around um uh, youth development with football within our little southeast queensland corner of the world is um coaches getting discouraged to do skill in isolation i think because it's seen as a no-no it's seen as um oh it's quicker it's it's not effective it's quicker if you do it in a in a more of a uh what we call a positioning game or a or a, a game training scenario so um as you described like we if we we've got our we've in our curriculum we've got our four core skills so we call it the uh so running with the ball what one v one so that's your fakes and feigns um first touch and striking the ball so first touch of the balls and then striking the balls passing and shooting at goal so it's broken down into those those um those areas uh however they, they do actually miss well a lot of debate was around they missed one which is defending we don't we don't explicitly teach defending in the skill acquisition phase so we're talking around the under nines to under 12 um age group so for me um i think that it's so important that we don't throw away skill in isolation because um you get the repetition um and that for me is really important because if you do just throw them into a game training scenario and and as you said the disconnect between the um consistency of executing the skill diminishes when you throw a lot of decision making in front of them and if your players aren't in that associative or autonomous phase of learning um it's just going to break down all the time and they don't get the opportunity to practice and and that for me is you've to get that i suppose that transition in from skill and isolation into a game uh, a training game um you know it takes time and you've got to have patience to get it at a at a good quality but I also and there's no research that I've looked that I've seen that says all right if you just teach skills in game training scenarios it's quicker the, the players develop quick um, rap more rapidly I don't I've never seen any piece of research that shows that so I think um, it's, it's when you do it you don't spend your whole training session in skill in isolation of course no, I mean I mean on that on that model I would yeah. spend I'd, I'd introduce something in isolation for 10 yeah. to 15 minutes and then I spend virtually all the rest of the coaching environment in oppositional game, oppositional game. And it, we really have to go back to fix something if we have to do it in isolation. So there's things like, there's things like tackle technique where it's a bit like brushing your teeth. If you don't brush your teeth for a few weeks, tackle technique can slip. Grip, pass, catch, carry. If you don't practice your grip, pass, catch, carry, your, your, your passing technique and your catching technique can slip. If you don't brush your teeth for a few weeks, your teeth are going to get yellow, right? So, but a smart coach, in my mind, can combine those things in something else. So they can have the, the, the mental uh, flexibility to be looking at a game and still recognise a player's grip, pass, catch, carry, Right? Yeah, that is still that is still the individual skill, but it's within a game or a opposition uh, based practice. And I think earlier you made a comment that there's no research uh, out there about um, about the way no. people people learn in 
in uh, was it? It was isolation. You mentioned, wasn't it? No, no. Well, I said I haven't uh, seen a lot, or I haven't uh, seen any research that you know, people go around saying, "Oh, if you just coach, um, if they just if you just do game training scenarios, they will pick, they will develop their skills, the application, yeah. the tech skills quicker." That I'll bring in something else. So, a very English thing is to do whole part whole. You teach the whole. Yeah. Yeah, and I do this quite a lot. You 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 look at the whole and you put it into a context, and then you strip it back into the parts so that you can practice X Y Z. Yeah. So the example might be you play in rugby league or in soccer, 13, 13, 11 versus eleven. You play and say, "This is what I'm trying to get you to achieve." Now we're going to go back. We're going to compact. We're going to practice the component parts and get those better in units, and then we put it back into the whole. And I think. To, you know the blanket statement about um, game-based training so many people get that wrong because they just put them in a game and then sort of hope yeah that things fix themselves and i agree with you you've got to coach and i think game-based coaching the key is the coaching intervention so when i'm coaching my teams when my coaching environment is humming i run the 13 versus 13 like the scrimmage for want of a better term I have a left side coach and a right side coach and I will spot something. So it might be a player turning his hips in in defence or her hips in and I'll, for want of a better term, scream to that player and say, get your hips square. And then my assistant coach on that side will go and spend time fixing that. So it's a combination of the, of the three methods of the isolation opposition game because the coach is coming in and giving them some isolation and opposition training just in that little unit, and that's how that's how I master it. It's a it's a fascinating conversation. If we're not careful, mate, we'll end up talking about this for three hours. Or we go we go on to the next topic. Uh, okay. You had a question. You had a question to bring to the lockdown lounge. Um, yeah, I did. So my topic is, and it and it sort of sisters in really well with what we were just talking about. With um, you know, do do you explicitly teach skills? So how how do you? And you, you sort of mentioned it. You went into it a little bit as well. So how do you explicitly coach decision making? So I'll throw that one over to you first. Okay, so it totally ties in with what we've just been discussing. Yeah, I one of the principles of coaching that I have, and I think. Early in my coaching career, definitely didn't have this, but about five years into it, I started to learn. I, I, I believe the genius, in inverted commas, and you can have some flexibility with that, but the genius resides within the players, and it's our job as a coach to tease that out. So I'm going to say this in real simple layman's terms. I'm not going to use any... Uh, complicated language or theory but basically we are amazing as humans we can do amazing things we can do things without even thinking about them so if you do you remember Joel brushing your teeth this morning yes do you remember every little every little moment of the brush going to the left to the middle to the right to the or did you do many things on autopilot do you remember driving your car the last time you drove your car do you remember every little every little step that you that you took no. driving that car no and that's because you've done it over and over and over and over again and you are instinctively um mentally cutting out so many things that aren't important so if it's your toothpaste and your toothbrush to so grab your toothpaste, grab your toothbrush, you might have even not been looking. You might have just put your hand down and done it and brr, 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 brush your teeth. Um, driving your car, you could get in your car now. You go out, drive out the garage, and you will probably drive the vast majority of that time on autopilot, right? It's a very dangerous place to be in when you think that road safety is a real issue in society. But ultimately, we do drive on autopilot the vast majority of the time, don't we? We think about anything apart from the road and the car sometimes because we're so good at doing it. And we can instinctively look and see cars and pedestrians. And we don't need to put all our focus on that. We don't sit in the car and look at the road like this and then go, right, I've got to change gears now. And then look at the gear. Oh, I've now got to put my foot on the clutch. Oh, you know, we don't do that. And that's because we've practiced it and practiced it and practiced it. So as a coach, 
You asked me how I coach decision making. I put the, them in de, in situations through that framework I just told you about. So isolation doesn't include decision making, but opposition and game does. But what I actually do quite often is stop and start. So I'm very comfortable coaching game because I believe I can recognize the different moving parts and I can see space. I can see, especially if you stand back as a coach, 20 or 30 meters, you can see space. And that's why spectators always sit in a grandstand and go, why didn't you pass to there or move the ball now to the left? There's a space and the players don't see it. And I just teach them while they're training and I'll do a turnover. So if you imagine, I'll put it in your context, soccer, right? If you've, if the red team have got possession and you want them to pass to a certain place and they don't, you just blow the whistle, turn it over, give it to the blue team. They'll soon work out where they should have passed to. Right. And that's ultimately our coach decision making. It's uh, uh, because I firmly believe that the genius resides in that player and they don't need to be they don't need an instruction manual of how to find that space they need to work it out in their subconscious and eventually they will work out the cause and effect so in rugby league if you took three plays to the left the defense will do a certain thing which means there'll be space on the right or there'll be a fragmented defensive line. And that forms the basis of decision making. So ultimately, that's how I teach it. I put them into game situations and I stop and start and say, what could you have done there? What did you see there? And then the other thing to throw on top of that is video. So if you video training sessions and say, why didn't you shift the ball then? Or why didn't you give draw and pass there? And I quite often find that my first trial of the season in any preseason with a new team it is it is full of poor decision making from the players because they're not used to it because in rugby league they quite often coach to to bash to run the ball up bang 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 not look left and right so i'm i'm a big decision making coach in rugby league terms well i'm i'm a little bit different in the in the way i go about teaching or coaching explicit decision making so i i do think that if you can break it down and make it as simple as possible for the players they're going to be they're going to be more successful in in um in the, when it comes to the game so for me i like to you know let's let's look at the game in 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 terms of the four main moments of our game so we've got obviously in possession out of possession and then the, the two transition moments so from when you're going to get the ball uh when you haven't got the ball and you're about to get the ball what are you doing and then uh the opposite of that so when you have the ball and you're about to lose it so if you look at let's just say we keep it simple let's let's look at um your in possession of your team's in possession of the ball so individually how do we how do we influence players to make better decisions um in a game in in the game so for me breaking it down um and and using what we call cues and and tasks and triggers um, so players start to recognize what's in front of them and you know there's if this happens can you do this or if that happens can you do that and giving them options and then making it simple so for example um, the old if you receive the ball back to goal with a with a defender shutting you down so tight behind you make it simple can you play backwards from where it came or sideways to keep possession of the ball because keep and or you might you never take away from the player all right you've you've got no other option so then maybe you can drop your shoulder and try and turn the other way but we want to we we players that are effective in doing that we want to we don't want to take that away that away from them but can we keep possession of the ball so making it simple if you get on the outside of the player so you, you've created a little bit of space you've 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 got on their shoulder when you get the ball passed to you, can you take your first touch, you know, in behind that in that in behind that player? So, trying to give them those tasks and cues of recognizing things in the game, and then all right, well, it's this is a good decision if I if I look to get my first touch here into space, or um, I can feel the player coming and shutting me down. 
I've got to protect the ball, so I take my first touch backwards into the space and keep it. So, um, and then it gets more complex from a team perspective. What are we trying to do within the team model when we have the ball? So, you know, as a collectively within those work, moving parts within the game, you know, can we shift the ball from left side of the, of the field to the right side? How's the best to do that? It, you know, obviously the space is always on the other side of the, the pitch because teams, you know, shuffle across, get compact and narrow. So for me, helping them do that through giving them explicit tasks, cues and triggers, um, for me is a really, I've found a really effective way of um, helping players make better decisions in the game. I think what came through though there is that ultimately I think we both agree that the player has to work them out, work it out for themselves with help. That's right. So, so I think if you the, Jose Jose Mourinho used to call it guided discovery. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. For sure. Um, that's it. But then, how you? I suppose then the methodology behind how you're doing that again. Um, building up uh, from no, you know, using your mannequins and, and um, <clears throat> doing a bit of shadow play, you know, um, then bringing in live defenders, 3v2s, um, you know, you, you, your 3v2s, your 4v3s, 4v2s, that sort of things in your... Well, that's, it, call, that's interesting how you put in the mannequins before the people. I go straight yeah. to the people. Yeah, well, that that's that you can do that, but again, like... I suppose if you put straight in, if you put for me, if you put straight in um, opposition um, and pressure uh, without working on some of the, building the tasks and cues, then um, you know you, they're not going to be as successful. So you know you can, as you said, you can go whole part whole um, and and throw the throw the opponent in, then step it away, no pressure, then bring back to the game as as you said. Um, or you can build up. You can set up, set up in you know what we call shadow play, and, and work with mannequins in front, build up, and then into maybe into, into more of a complex situation where you've got four v twos or three v twos in in positioning games. Um, yeah. So there's there's as I said, I'm not a fan of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and I think we you you've got to draw on many many different I suppose. Um, methodologies to be able to to coach those things irony of the week football soccer which you um tend to have players who are quite slim and lean yeah you you use mannequins which are actually quite wide right well, depends what brand do Wait, you buy hang on rugby league players rugby league coaches where we tend to be a bit bigger we tend to use poles the thinner thing what an <laughs> irony um all right, so we've we've covered our two topics, and mate, what one thing I was thinking when you were talking there, in future weeks, what we'll do with this is we'll actually go on the training field, we'll mic ourselves up, we'll have some players, and we'll we'll both teach what we've just been discussing and talk about it. Um, I had a question, I had a question from my mate Hutchie. Um, he's under a pseudonym on Facebook, though. I think he always gets banned. Um, <laughs> at what stage can a player become uncoachable? Oh. Gee, that's a. I don't think ever. Like, there's, there's. I suppose there's. It comes to a point where, um, how how far are you as a coach willing to keep being patient with a player? If if that's what we're talking about, we're talking about attitude of a player, um, their willingness to learn new things or be open minded to being coaches. Um, my brother in law wants me to give him a wave. There you go, <laughs> Ben. Um, hello hello ben <laughs> yeah so i think um i think there's never a time where a player for, becomes uncoachable i suppose what for me for me is they might become uncoachable for you and um you know that's that's something that uh you've got to you've got to be able to i suppose manage with players um that that for me is I don't know it just seems to be something that um, it, it varies from player to player. I think I think, I I think, think uh, of course, sorry mate go on go on. Do anymore, but um, it, it's it's 
it's something that um, I would hate to to say. Oh, that there's a time where someone has an expiry date in terms of Kieran, their... Kieran, Gavin, up the creek, up the creek. Um, <laughs> some people, some people will be up the creek this morning if they went out last night under lockdown. They'll be under a certain type of creek. Um, I think a player becomes uncoachable sometimes due to father time right yeah so so i'm going to tell you a tale when i was at penrith hang on hang on i'm gonna get comfortable then oh oh, here we go when i was at (laughs) penrith it won't be that long i don't waffle on like you the 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 penrith coaches there they talked about how they tried to change petro sivana sievers grip pass catch carry petro sinner receiver at the time was about 59 years old and playing no it was about it was about 32 31 and they oh. learn they learn during that time that they couldn't change his grip pass catch carry they could short term uh in a drill or in a bit of pre-season but the minute again kicked in and they reverted to type they went back to what they know the best so i think a player becomes a little bit uncoachable in certain skills, in certain things, when they get to a certain age. Because you know the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, well, I think um, I think it applies to coaching. I think there's real, the, the, there's real uh, life examples. And I also think there's another thing called ego. Ego. Some players just can't be coached because they think that you-know-what doesn't stink. So, and I, I tell you now, if there are some in rugby league, they will be in soccer. Oh, 100%, 100%. Um, but I suppose where I'm coming from is that I like to try and bring out the best in, in, in players. And, yeah, you, there's sometimes you can't help them. And they, they you sort of, the, the time I've said to players, the time, I, the, the time I stop talking to you and trying to help you means I've given up. Mate of mine, Peter, has sent through a thousand questions. Um, right. And I'll answer the first one first, and then you, and then you add to it. How do you balance a squad? I.e., how many of each position, and how would you do this for a school team, club team, NRL, etc.? Um, I always use a few um, philosophies that I learned off a man called Alex Ferguson from reading a lot about him and reading a lot of his books and, and watching a lot about him. Basically. I think in any team, you have your stars and you have your fillers. So you have those people that um, just turn up week in, week out, do the same job. They don't have much of an ego. They are obsessed with work. They work on improving their, their game with effort. So I'll give you an example. A prop in rugby league might just be about his carries or her carries the effectiveness of those carries and they just keep turning up, keep turning up, keep turning up, keep turning up. I call them your fillers in a team. And then you have your star players, the ones that score the points or make the inroads. And I think your team needs a balance of those. And I think in my sport, the majority of teams that win premierships at any level of the game aren't overloaded with stars. They've got enough sprinkling of stardust, but they are surrounded by uh, a big chunk of players. And I wouldn't like to put a number on it, but it was something like eight, nine, ten, right? Something like that. That are, they will just turn up and do the same thing every week. They know they will never let you down. And then another thing, especially that Alex Ferguson used to espouse, and this, if you're coaching a junior team, you can't really do this, but if you're coaching an adult team, you basically need to have your squad in three components you need to have the young excitable hungry players that have got the best in front of them because they still have that glint in their eye you need a chunk of them that are in their peak and you need a couple that are experienced but might be coming to the end and alex ferguson always used to talk about and he's famed for this getting rid of them before they became past their use-by date. And there's a few NRL clubs that are good at that too. Uh, Melbourne and Sydney Roosters 
uh, are two that spring to mind. And Alex Ferguson used to always talk about having three three thirds, and if you can get as many as you can in the peak, but they need to have enough youth to push them because that puts pressure on those on the peak to keep driving their standards and the experienced heads to, to calm everyone down and give everyone the guidance so that would be my thoughts there can you give that some um soccer context mate yeah i suppose if you bring it into club land and more um i suppose not at the professional level but the semi-professional level um i think um if we're talking about a first team um, environment there's most 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 coaches work on the two players for every position type rule where they you know obviously competition for for places those those types of things um, or you might have uh, a player a couple of players in the, in a squad where that can play you know multiple positions within um, maybe uh, you might have a, a wide player that can play a, a defensive role or an attacking role so fullback winger that sort of thing or, a, or an attacking midfielder that can be a striker as well so you've got different you can you can double it up that way i think if you become down to a youth development level sometimes you get the players you get you don't get a a full swing at at, at a you know proper trial and and getting the players in that that you needed for certain positions so you've sort of got to um make do with what you have and and you're constantly trying to balance things and then you've got um you know, so it's important, I think, to at the youth development level to to have players playing in a couple of different um, positions as well and learning a different few different positions so that they are, um, I suppose, more adaptable when it comes to first team football. Um, so for me, um, I think that's in terms of balancing the squads at a youth youth level, sort of out of your your hands sometimes as a coach. Um, but for me, if you've got those core players in your squad that are reliable, you spoke about, you know, obviously um, not having too many of the, the so-called stars, but those that are consistent in carrying out and executing their roles within a squad um, in terms of their technical ability as well, consistent in, in, in doing that as well. Um, you know, that spine of your team, you know, your centre-backs, you have at least three players that can play well in, in a centre back position. Um, so a, a cup maybe a couple of defensive midfielders and if you've got that structure with with at least two to three attacking players that can play across your front line, um, then I think you're in good you're in good stead with a squad when you and you can build around that. Um, where I think it gets challenging is if you have too many like midfielders, you've got like maybe six, seven, eight midfielders in your squad um, that can't really play anywhere else, then you're stuck. Um, Pep, Pep apparently likes midfielders, doesn't he? He said he can have a... Apparently he's quoted once he could have a team full of midfielders. Well, I think what will let you down there is there... <laughs> you need... You, for me, you need those... The key, key is set, the, your centre-backs. You need to have quality centre-backs in any squad if you're going to be successful. And then you need... You need um, Obviously, if you've got for for me, I had a, had a squad recently where I had you know probably seven midfielders, and only <laughs> only two of them could play elsewhere, and that re and that was a real struggle. And and the ones that could play elsewhere, I re I really actually wanted to use them more centrally, so they actually got sacrificed, and um, you know I had to play right back and or right wing, and and it didn't re it suited it it suited the squad, but didn't really suit them. So you've got it at youth youth development too you've got a level you've got to balance that out you've got to do you've got to try and get what's best for the player as well because you, you're trying to help them you know make a career out of it yeah um i want to talk about the size issue right we'll, we'll do this for the last sort of quarter of an hour the um is there a culture in the round ball game where size is an issue um Talking about for, for recruitment pop, purposes, yeah, yeah. So um, I think I think you're starting to touch on um, obviously the early early developers, late developers. That that sort of argument is that where you're going with it? But um, size. So so well, I, 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 I I'm a big Manchester City fan, Joel, as you know, and yeah. I think in the Premier League where um, teams can really disrupt 
what a flowing football team can do and they put 10 men behind the ball, I think Manchester City would have always benefited from having a big, tall striker so that instead of trying to play through them around the feet, they could stick the ball over the top and get it on somebody's noggin. And hopefully Harry Kane will be that answer. So, um, and then a look at, um, I'm trying to think of some teams in the past, but Jose has been known to have a few sides that are actually quite physically menacing. And they can uh, win most high balls or, or jostle people off the ball. Uh, my question is, is size... Is size an issue in football? So, so you, you, when you're talking about recruiting and you're looking at, at those types of players, I suppose, in a first-team setup, um, it, it comes down to your, 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 your philosophy, really, in terms of how you want to play the game, what, what, how you want to go about creating goal-scoring chances, how you're going to defend. Um, for me, football is the most... Um, is probably the game where um, size doesn't matter. Um, it, it, it's probably the only one it does is a goalkeeper. Um, you know, I've always said that about you. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's the least, it's the least height by, um, height by a sport around. It doesn't matter what sort of shape you are. You can be a footballer. And, um, I think, um, traditionally your center backs, a big tall beast of guys. And you, you spoke about, you know, if you want to have a second option of, whipping um, 50-50 balls into the box for, for a Peter Crouch to try and get his head on at the, the end of the day. Um, it, that comes down to the, the individual coach's philosophy. So um, I think um, if you're in control of picking your squad um, and you've got a, a, a team model and how you, how you want to go about playing the game, then um, obviously you're going to pick players based on, on how how you feel they're going to best implement well, that. What's your, what's your, uh, you've got Utopia. What's your team model? What's your preferred? Uh, look, I, I like a lot of pace up front. So it's not so much the, the, the height of a player. Um, I, I like to try and break lines from the middle third and expose space um, uh, it, in behind. I, I want to keep, keep the ball. I want to break down opponents. Um, I want to play in between lines. So for me, for me, I, I like quick, Intensive players that have um, good, uh, I suppose, um, intensive actions. Um, they can they can play the game at a high tempo, um, and good technical ball players because I want to be able to switch play quickly and then play in behind with and, and make use of those those quick players up top um, to 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 use the space in behind. Um, I also think that, um, and you know, as you know, I'm I'm an Arsenal fan. That's what's let Arsenal down. Is they've never, they've never. The the the, the last part of it is having those centre backs. You know that are that are, you know, your strong, tough, bustling um, centre backs. But that that but they need to be ball players. So that they're the they're the diamonds in the rough. That you know, like your Tony Adams, and they don't exist as much anymore. So uh, um, <clears throat> getting those, developing those type of players, that um, they're key for me. Obviously, in rugby league, size is, an, is, is can be an issue. So um, there's a saying amongst, amongst a lot of coaches, and I don't necessarily agree with this, but they always say a good a good big one is better than a good little one, mm. right? Um, I don't always agree. So there's different phases of the game where size has mattered. So the NRL had an under-20s competition that was really high profile between 2008, I think, and it wrapped up a few years ago. And a lot of the recruitment managers really went towards size because obviously those recruitment managers, if they're on two- or three-year contracts, if their under-20s team is winning or getting close to winning premierships or looking good, they can buy themselves time as a recruitment manager, right? Mm. And under-20s football because a lot of the players still didn't have the mental maturity to defend for 80 minutes and stay in the grind for 80 minutes, there was quite a lot of points in that competition. And the big teams tended to, tended to prevail, right? If you look at the game right now, with the six-again rule, um, with the clamp down sometimes on high tackles and the emphasis on uh, speeding up the rug, you could argue that the little man is slowly, slowly, slowly creeping back into the game. I've never been sizest. If I could have my utopia, 
I want to, I want to um, create a team that is fast, strong, and mobile. Because I always felt, as an old rugby league pro, playing against teams that were fast, strong, and mobile, my marbles were rattling in my head because as a big fella, I struggled to move sideways. And of course, in rugby league, there's a yin and a yang. There's a, there's, a, there's a positive and a negative. If you've got a big team that can bash through the opposition, that's great as long as they've got equal possession or better of the football. If you have to defend a lot and you're defending against a mobile, gritty, uh, pressure-based, pressure-building team, then all of a sudden your lateral defence gets exposed because you've got some quite big humans in your side. So, morning, John. I think um, there's a there's an argument for both. In the school game, if you look at the school game in the 70s and 80s in Australia, the players tended to be a lot smaller than they are now. In a game that lasts 30 minutes a half, and at times it has been 25 minutes a half, if you can get a big side and they barge through the opposition, the game's over. If they get to 18, 24 nil, the game's over. Yeah. Because there's not enough time. So I believe, I think the summation there is that in rugby league, size does matter. In rugby, in, in football, it might not matter. I've just had another question here from Harley. How are you doing, Harley? In junior rugby league, how do you deal with parents who believe their child is going to be the next NRL superstar? It's very difficult to do what's best for the team when you always have somebody in your ear criticising and getting upset. Well, Wayne Bennett always face, famously said, Harley, if you listen to the fans, you'll end up sitting in the grandstand with them. Um, my advice is get a team manager and get them to deal with the parents. Yeah, I think in football it's a major issue as well. Um, it's the, it can actually be quite cancerous to a to a squad, particularly at a youth youth level. Um, yeah, you need a strong TD at the club that can deal with that sort of stuff, and you don't want to have to deal with it as a coach. Sometimes you have to, you know. Um, but I think if you've got someone helping you with that sort of things, uh, 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 someone at the club that's you know football manager or technical director or whatever they want to call call it. Um, deal with those types of issues i think take that away from the coach or let the coach coach um people can find you online joel can't they they can they can find me online um so jsfootball.com.au they can go on there and uh, plenty of uh uh on the sus subscribers part of the 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 web page um lots of uh coach education things on there and and uh in terms of blogs also looking at there's lots of uh, exercises you can grab those mums or dads who get you know stuck with coaching uh under eights team or under nines team they can go and grab some exercises off there make their life a lot simpler um so less than a dollar a week you can subscribe and get get access to that to that to those things so have okay. have a go a dollar a dollar a week rugbyleaguecoach.com.au little plug there here's the here's yeah. the logo um would it be less than a dollar a week? I don't know. I've never really thought of it like that. Oh, um, but yeah, I'm on rugbyleaguecoach.com. Hey, Joel, if anybody wants to get hold of you and yeah, just email stuff. Uh... Yeah, just email me uh, jsfootball07 at gmail dot com. Mm. Yeah. Um, mate, uh, some people have joined us late. For anybody who's joining us late. Um, I'm going to put this straight on the Rugby League Coach Facebook page. Joel will share it on his if you are a football type. Um, mate, it's probably a good place to wrap it up there. Thank you. Yeah. One, of the one of the problems with coffee with coaches is we made a rod for our own back. The, um, I would like to get the UK and Europe more involved, but obviously most of them are all asleep now. Although, well. although, although I have seen Jack Roden up. Greg Bale's joining us now. He's only just woke up. Um, Jack will probably be on the j drink Jack Roden, let us know if you're still there Sione, thank you for your kind messages I've seen them pop up um, and also New Zealand as well so we'll look at different times but we will always leave the recording up there up there afterwards and one of the problems with coffee with coaches is, I don't know about you but I've run out of coffee yeah same, empty, need a refill yeah, yeah, yeah so 
We'll go off and get another coffee. Um, some people are sending some nice things through. Chris Neal, thanks, mate. All yeah, good. Thanks, thanks for the support. Appreciate that. Yeah, th thanks to everyone who's tuned in. Um, you know, we weren't expecting a massive turnout for the first one. Um, ben, thank you. Thank you, Ben Trim. Um, we weren't expecting a massive group for the first one, but it'll grow and grow. Me and Joel talk to each other all the time. Or should I say, um, Joel talks and I just sit there pretending I'm listening. Isn't that right, Joel? Um, <laughs> uh, no, joking. We talk all the time um, and we decided to put it on, on, on this kind of format. Um, we're always looking for ideas and everything else. And remember, if you didn't enjoy it, if you thought it was crap, it is only a pilot show. Pilot show, wasn't it? Episode one pilot. pilot the first pilot. The first pilot. Um, yeah. We'll do something again next weekend, mate. Yeah, let's go for it. Um, I know people got some, uh, got some um, something out of it too, you know. In terms oh, yeah. Of they're uh, starting their coaching journey as well. Yeah, some some of the people that are on here are well in, immersed in their coaching journey. And I think one of the things I've noticed since Corona is that coach education has really slipped from governing bodies. They've sort of shoved that to the bottom of their need to do list um so anything like this is hopefully beneficial and i think you and i both um we're so experienced in the community games in particular as well that we can we can talk on that level thanks buddy go and get yourself another coffee another yeah, latte thanks for the chat and we'll see you next time take care see you everyone bye